Thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 364, Mussolini's PR Nightmare. Last time, with the opening of 1942, Admiral Cunningham in Egypt, nor Air Commander Hugh Pugh Lloyd on Malta, were happy with the current situation. The Admiral had lost two battleships thanks to a daring Italian attack while in the port of Alexandria, while the air commander had to contend with the return of the Germans and their Messerschmitt 109s, without Spitfire planes, the only planes capable of keeping up with the deadly German machines. The heady days of chasing Italian planes away from Malta or sinking Italian ships on their way to North Africa was over. Malta and its defenders were back to simply trying to hold out. And it was the same for the nighttime flyers. Tommy Thompson, a member of the Malta Night Fighter Unit, or MNFU, now changed to 1435 Flight, noticed the increase in nighttime raids and the number of enemy planes involved. Still, the MNFU was able to score a few hits as they were now working with radio-controlled searchlights. Pilot Alex Mackey had downed an Italian bomber plane early in January, and Tommy had helped out in downing another. But even better, on January 3rd, Tommy was able to get close to a Ju-88 and give it a quick burst of his bullets. The result was the target losing pieces of itself, but whether it went down or not, Tommy could not say for sure. Such was fighting and flying at night. But the new year also brought a worsening of the weather. Yes, December had been full of rain, but now the clouds were pushed around by high winds and the rain remained. Hence, there was less flying in January. A gift from the god of war, if you will. Still, the weather might have been giving the pilots a break, but the Maltese people had to deal with the winds and the rain in their bombed-out structures. Indeed, the rain continued on enough to soak the fighter airfields at Lucca and Takali, so those planes were sent to the bomber airfield at Lucca, as it was longer and a bit drier. But there was a downside to this which sent Hugh Pugh into fits of rage. First, the increased number of planes in one place meant that the organization on Lucca's bomber field was decreased. Next, the additional planes, again all in one area, made it a more desirable target for the Axis planes coming from Sicily. It was nothing short of hell and had to be endured. It wasn't until January 22nd that the night fighting unit could take off again, and they were eager to do so, as they had a surprise for the Axis. It's not known why this did not take place earlier, maybe during the first six months of the night unit's existence, But when they went up again, the planes were fitted with different fuel tanks, which allowed them more time in the air. Enough time to fly to Sicily, patrol the skies over the island, and seek out the Axis bombers before they took off. Not much happened that night, but on the 25th, the night flyers were up and at it again over Sicily. And in their hearts, they burned for revenge. For earlier that day, the Germans had showed their cleverness, which caused the Malta-based fighters to lose several planes and two pilots. Earlier on January 25th, two supply ships were leaving Grand Harbor, escorted by 22 hurricanes. But as the hurricanes were still climbing to get to a sufficient height, they were pounced upon, a la Claire Chenault or Pappy Boynton. Coming out of the sun with the speed of a dive, 12 109s set upon the climbing defenders, taking out seven hurricanes, while three more were forced to return home, now damaged. Of those stricken pilots, four had managed to bail out, two crash-landed, and one was lost. With this done and the sky theirs, the Germans continued on to how far in the southeast corner and damaged two more hurricanes that were parked side by side. Later that day, but before the night crew flew to Sicily, MNFU Alex Mackey had taken off to test his plane just one more time. Suddenly, he was set upon by several 109s that had flown in under the radar and had not been noticed by the spotters. Alex Mackey went down for the last time. In this one day, Malta lost 13 planes and two pilots, This was not sustainable. Something 
had to be done. Perhaps the raid on Sicily that night would help even things out, but it did not. That night, the AA flak was intense, and only one bomber was destroyed on the ground at the Comiso airfield in southern Sicily. A few days later, the night flyers went to Sicily again. At least this time, the flak was less intense, which allowed the hurricanes, with more fuel than previously, to stay around and shoot up anything that caught their eye. Specifically, Tommy Thompson strafed two trucks that ran off the road and exploded. His next victim was a staff car. Now, some poor officer would have to walk. Just before leaving Sicily, Tommy shot up the Coast Guard station at Cape Passero, located on a small island just off Sicily's southern tip. As emotionally satisfying as this was, it did not alter the new momentum of the Axis. By the end of January, 50 hurricanes had been lost, the eight shot out of the sky, and the rest while still on the ground. Indeed, by the end of January, the Malta pilots only had 28 hurricanes that were still airworthy. For the entire war so far, 340 hurricanes had been sent to Malta. Air Officer Commanding Hugh Pugh Lloyd was just as stressed and depressed as his men, but it was his job to do something about it. So, as his pilots focused on taking on the Germans and the Italians, Hugh Pugh took on the British Chiefs of Staff. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History. Assassins vs. Templars is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. By the end of January 1942, Hugh Pugh had sent requests to his immediate supervisor, Air Marshal Arthur Tedder, and to the Air Ministry back home. And at first, he was getting what the previous governor, Dobby, had, a drip, drip, drip of hurricanes and no spitfires. Then Vice Admiral in Charge Malta and Admiral Superintendent Malta Dockyard Wilbraham Ford on his flagship HMS St. Angelo got involved and bombarded the Chiefs of Staff with his requests for Spitfires and Mosquitoes. These are the British twin-engine aircraft, basically a fast unarmed bomber. Fortunately, all this shouting via paperwork got the attention of Air Marshal Tedder. Near the end of January, he sent his own man, Senior Air Staff Officer Group Captain Basil Embry, to Malta. His job was to look around, talk to people, and get the straight dope for Tedder. And this he did. Embry talked to people at RAF HQ and Valletta, and the three main airfields, and then not just to the pilots, but to the ground crews as well. Here are a few snippets from his report to Tedder. I am informed that the German fighter pilots often fly in front of our hurricanes in order to show off their superiority of the 109s. This is bound to have an increasingly adverse effect on the morale of the pilots. Paraphrasing the next part, Embry stated that he was told that while the latest Spitfires, Mark 5s, could climb to 25,000 feet in the 15 minutes it took the Axis bombers to reach Malta from Sicily, The hurricanes currently on the island, within that same 15 minutes, could only reach 15,000 feet, 
which made them perfect targets for the approaching German fighters. Next, Tedder's envoy noted that the conditions the pilots lived in was completely unacceptable. General Dobby had said the same thing the previous year, and since those conditions would probably not change any time soon, Basil suggested that the pilots be rotated out every six months. Lastly, the report suggested that Malta needed an operations controller who already had considerable experience, so that person could come to Malta and hit the ground running. In the end, Embry's assessment was that every step should be taken to send to Malta Spitfire Fives and Kitty Hawks. The details of this report were shared with those on Malta, but no one who flew or worked on planes held their breath. As pilot Tom Neal put it, the airships versus the word lordship would do as they pleased. Hopefully, it pleased them to save Malta. Adding on to this tale of woe was the already lost battleships of Admiral Cunningham, Valiant, and Queen Elizabeth. And to the west of Malta, on the same day that the Italian frogmen had attacked in Alexandria's harbor, Force K at one time made up of eight ships, was all but lost. Like the Malta-based pilots, Force K had helped to make sure that during the previous November, 60% of Axis shipping did not reach North Africa. Well, the Italians came up with a plan. Back on December 18th, the same day as the attack at Alexandria, Force K was heading right for an Axis convoy. The British ships had done this plenty of times and expected another shoot-up, until it was not. Heading at the enemy ships, a few swordfish planes were overhead to spot the enemy and attack if they could. But suddenly, all that planning went out the window as most of the ships of Force K ran into mines. The convoy was real enough, but its position? That had been a trap. The cruiser Neptune, recently joining Force K, hit four mines and went down in minutes. Only one crewman from almost 700 survived. The ship's motto had been, to reign is to serve, and she had served. She was soon joined by the destroyer Kandahar as she had tried to get close to the Neptune to commence rescue operations, when she hit a mine at 3.18 a.m. in the early morning of December 19th. Her bow was blasted off, and the ship was out of control, as she now had no power. As for the other ships, they each hit a mine as well, but were able to limp home. All told, by late January, Malta was being pounded. Its defending planes were outnumbered and outmatched, and Cunningham's fleet to the southeast and Gibraltar's Force K were out of action for a while, which meant the Italian convoys sailed on to Tripoli unmolested. The good news for Tag Nat Gold was that he would be leaving in January of 1942, but it was his last month that epitomized the living conditions of every pilot on Malta. First, there was the renewed attacks on the various airfields, Grand Harbor and random strafing. Next, due to the increased bombing, the pilots and crews were getting very little sleep, which was its own problem. Next, supplies were becoming an issue again. In total, life was quickly becoming hell for those on Malta, certainly for the ones whose job it was to defend it. But to use Nat Gold one last time as an example for the other pilots, even his leaving was fraught with danger. As the Axis now controlled the skies over the Mediterranean, the moment Nat's merchant ship left Grand Harbor on its way to Alexandria, it was bombed and bombed again by German planes. Nat watched as an escorting destroyer was literally lifted out of the water by several close explosions. He could see the propellers turning for a second before the ship was slammed back into the sea. Even after that, Nat could not get out of his head the friends he had lost, those who were seriously wounded, nor the sight of 100 Axis planes flying over Malta. Yeah, it was a good time to vacate this island from hell. And yet, though the heady days of the previous autumn were behind them, 
when Malta's fighters, bombers, ships, and submarines were practically cutting the link between Sicily and North Africa, there was still some fight in the men and women there. For one, the subs could operate regardless of the weather, and they did, but with far fewer successes. The sub upholder had not scored a single kill for all of last December, not something the islanders had been accustomed to. Yes, the upholder's crew missed their number two, Tubby Crawford, but somehow the rest of the men could feel that the momentum had changed that winter. Shrimp Simpson and his bosses believed that the men were burnt out and would rotate them out when they could, but for now, all had to stay in place and do their best. It was the same for the island-based bombers, so when the weather permitted, raids were sent against Sicily. And the results were respectable enough, as long as they were not compared to the fall of last year. On January 4th, 10 Blenheim twin-engine bombers were sent against Castel Vetrano Airfield, located on the western corner of Sicily. This was significant because, as Operation Crusader was in motion in December of 1941, the Axis forces were pushed out of Cyrenaica, thus flying supplies to Rommel from Crete was no longer an option, which meant the supplies would now have to come from Castel Fetrano. But when those ten Blenheim bombers flew over the airfield, they saw below them 75 aircraft parked wingtip to wingtip. By the time the bombers left, the place was left a smoking ruin. Back to the upholder, yes, December had been a dry month for the crew, but they made up for that during the first week of January. First, a freighter was sunk on January 4th, and then the Italian sub... Amiranglio Sant Bon was destroyed. Of those on board, 59 died, while only three survived. Like pilots and tank gunners, the men aboard the upholder did not think too much of the lives lost, but rather they thought of or they focused on taking out that war machine which could harm them. In such ways, killing is possible. Much of the rest of the 10th flotilla was told to stand down and take a much-needed break. The torpedo bombers on Malta also scored a major kill when they ganged up on the Italian ocean liner SS Victoria on January 23rd. Launched in 1930, the Victoria was the cutting edge of technology and sophistication. She even had air conditioning. Between this, her speed, and her sleek lines, the Victoria was given several nicknames, the White Arrow, the Dove of the Orient, and the Ship of the Maharajas. Either way, she was the pride of Italy's merchant fleet. Leaving Taranto, Victoria was a part of the convoy T-48, destined for Tripoli. However, Ultra, the intercepted and decoded radio and cable messages of the Axis, which was started by the British in 1941, made this coming convoy known to Malta, so several torpedo bombers were sent out. Given her size and beauty, she was naturally the main target. Coming from all directions, the bombers harassed the Italian ship like hornets seeking an opportunity. On January 23rd, the harassment began, but the Victoria survived, thinking, or rather hoping, it was all over. It was not. The next day, the British planes were back. At 5.25 p.m., a torpedo made contact with the Victoria in her stern. Now she was unable to move under her own power. And this is the death knell of any ship. The captain knew this well enough, so began abandoning ship. But as she was still afloat, this made her fair game for the planes overhead. At 7 p.m., Another torpedo slammed into her while she was close to the coast of the city of Sirta, in the Gulf of Sidra, to the southwest of Benghazi. This doomed the 249 men still aboard her. In some ways, this was just one more Italian ship to go down, but for Mussolini, it was a PR disaster, as much had been made of the ship as a luxury vessel during the 1930s. Now she was just the latest victim of Italian pride and British efficiency. 
But to cover up that the Allies were reading Italian naval messages, 69 Aerial Reconnaissance Squadron was kept in the air most hours of most days, so that London could claim one of her planes had spotted a convoy versus the truth, which was London and then Malta knowing what was going to leave, when and where, before the actual departure. All thanks to what had been labeled the Wizard War, or as Churchill put it, a war of science. And because he has been missed, at least by this podcaster, let's return to Adrian Warby Warburton. Warby was supposed to have gone to the home island, but seeing a master of his job, Warby was told to teach at the operational training unit in Egypt. Here's where the pilots go to for their last instruction before they're sent to a squadron. But after taking a short break, it was certainly due him, Warby was not happy at the school. There was no excitement. Besides, his girl, Christina, was still on Malta, so Warby wanted to stay in the area. And this became possible when he was allowed to switch to Number 2 Photo Reconnaissance Unit, or PRU. But here, Warby would not be flying the Maryland. No, PRU-2 had either stripped down hurricanes or stripped down bow fighters, twin-engine long-range strike fighters, that were faster and more maneuverable than Maryland's. So, all to the good. As the situation in North Africa was going their way at the moment, and the Middle East in general was staying under Allied control, the war cabinet thought it was time to think about invading Sicily. Simply deflecting attacks was not the way to win a war. No, it was time to go on the offensive, which is ironic as Kesselring was planning his own invasion of Malta. But first, photos, and lots of them, of Sicily were needed. So, 2PRU was ordered to make it so. But as Malta was closer, the pilots of 2PRU to carry this out would be based there. Warby was excited to get back to Christina, I I mean Malta, and his order came through on December 29th. The two planes were about to take off, but bad weather and low clouds descended over Egypt. The other pilot, who was actually Warby's superior, said, "Uh, we'd better wait. To which Warby, in his unique way, said, you can wait if you want to. I've got a girl waiting for me. So he took off. And being Warby, the weather affected him None at all, arriving safely. Indeed, by the time his superior showed up nine days later, all of Sicily, except the beaches and most of southern Italy, had been photographed by Warby. In terms of his job or his gal, Warby did not play around. And there was no chance of Warby getting in trouble for any of this because Hugh Pugh, the air officer commanding, made sure of that. He loved the photos that Warby brought to him. With that done, Hugh Pugh soon had Warby back over Tripoli taking photos. And there was one moment that has to be shared. One mission over Tripoli at this time had Warby approaching the harbor, which meant many guns below were trained on him. That was all right. This wasn't Warby's first rodeo, as he weaved back and forth, left and right, in and out of the exploding shells all around him. But then came time to take photos, which meant he had to fly straight and level. Suddenly, a large bang shook the entire plane, and the armor-plated door between the cockpit and the photo mechanic Ron Haddon was ripped off. Haddon had dove down in reaction to the explosion, but when he lifted his head, he saw Warby flying along like it was a day in the park. Oh, the explosions were still going off around him, but as Haddon later noted, he had his hat on top of his helmet, cigarette hanging from his lips, one elbow resting on the side of the cockpit, driving the plane with the other hand. His complete lack of fear and nonchalant attitude to the noise and from the flak was fantastic. Warby at his best. Fighters were chasing us, the port engine had failed, but he pressed home his Reese, and safely returned. Though Force K was practically wiped out, and Cunningham was down many ships, Malta and her various tentacles were still doing their part for the war, namely making it as hard as hell to get troops and supplies to Rommel. But 
Kessel Ring was just getting started. Postscript. Back to the mosquito bomber mentioned in this episode. Its claim to fame was that on January 30th, 1943, the 10th anniversary of the Nazis taking power in Germany, Hermann Goering was giving a radio address when a mosquito attacked the main Berlin broadcasting station. His speech went silent. He was not heard throughout the country that day. For once, the rather rotund commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, a cruel man who wanted Germany built in his image, was kept quiet. <laughs> 